This video is almost entirely about Pickett's Charge, but at the beginning of the day, there's a battle at uh, Culp's Hill. I'm just going to show you this very briefly, and I'm not going to show you the whole battle. There's almost nothing here. The enemy attacks into the water and promptly dies, and it's a very, very easy effort to go round up the few remaining ones. I replace my any losses I have in my artillery. Uh, my units are of pretty decent size. But uh, after the Battle of Gettysburg, I decided in all future multi-day battles, I'm going to pour in as many raw recruits as possible. This is the last time I don't do that. It screws up the casualty report, but I, I no longer care about the casualty report. I mean, into the After Gettysburg, you're into basically the end of the campaign. And it's kind of just a grind. And I'm going to just make sure that I have enough men in my units to uh, fight the battles. I do like the, the um, position I've taken up. I fall back and take up a good position. I expect the enemy to attack my position very aggressively. So I have this dream of him kind of charging into this, this wood line defense that I have and uh, my artillery doing lots of canister fire, but it, it doesn't quite work that way. As you know, if you occupy the fortifications in, that are really great historically, and if you've been to the battlefield, you know that they're basically stone walls and they're absolutely terrific. But if you occupy those in this game, they're terrible, and you will just suffer amazing an amazing number of casualties. They're they're terrible defensive positions. So that's not that's not historically accurate. So what I do in the, in the beginning part of the battle is he he advances his artillery to a really good position, and I send detached skirmishers out to hurt him. The six-pound rifle uh, guns are terrific. I keep singing their praises. They do an absolutely great job of uh, taking shots at his artillery. The 20-pound parrots, my new favorite gun, also do a great job. And my snipers do a great job. Now that I'm into the part of the game where you have a lot of units on the map, Micromanaging the the skirmisher units, not the detached skirmishers, but the the skirmishers and the snipers, it is just not worth it. So I have built way too many skirmisher units. I don't want to micromanage those guys. Not on big battlefields. Uh, a couple of sniper units, maybe. And by a couple of sniper units, I mean like uh, maybe two JF Browns, maybe three. Uh, in in my entire army, and that's it. I mean, I, it's just it's just not worth it. And otherwise, just uh, some detached skirmishers and call it good. The uh, ATS talked about this too, in, in his playthrough, how toward the end of the campaign, having an entire division of skirmishers just was not worth the effort. And he didn't think he said he didn't think he was going to do it again. It it the the skirmishers really pay off big in the early battles when you have a few units and, you know, it's not a big deal, but when you have 50 units and you have to micromanage these guys, it, it's just not worth the hassle. Um, some very, very positive news. The first mod, um, uh, the mod was actually released earlier, but a new version of the mod to upgrade, upgrade Ultimate General Civil War has been released by Panda Kraut, and it's available on details on Reddit. And one of the things it fixes is the how your sniper units behave, and that's just a great thing. I'm really looking forward to playing a game with, uh, with that mod, and not just because it fixes how snipers behave, 
but it fixes a lot of things in the game. I'm really looking forward to giving that a go. I think if, uh, you know, and that's what happens, if the development company doesn't invest the time to upgrade their game and fix it, then the modding community will step up and, you know, that's a great thing. And I appreciate the modders who step up and in this case, thank you, Panda Kraut, and thank you for the work you're doing. And, you know, that's, that's just terrific. And boy, there are a lot of games where the modding community has really saved the, the game itself. In fact, two of my favorite games come immediately to mind. Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines wouldn't be playable if it wasn't for the modding community, and they have done a, a, a great job of making that game one of the best games you can possibly play. And the Re Requiem team, also one of my favorite games, just love Requiem. Uh, Skyrim is unplayable but uh, Requiem is a great game. And um, yeah, that's, that's all the modding community. Hopefully we'll have a thriving mod modding community here for Ultimate General as well. So one of the mistakes I make in this battle is and, and this is, you know, I'm so excited. I'm doing, I'm fighting Pickett's Charge. I mean, this is just uh, someone who's gone to Gettysburg a million times and to actually be fighting Pickett's Charge. And I haven't fought Pickett's Charge in Ultimate General since the early release of Ultimate General Gettysburg, which is a very long time ago, it seems. So very excited to be fighting uh, Pickett's Charge uh, because usually when I do a campaign... There isn't a Pickett's Charge. There's like um, 2,000 guys in the entire Confederate Army by this point, and, you know, there's no charge. This is an actual charge. I mean, th this is a pretty good-sized force coming across the field, and this is very exciting. But one of the mistakes I make is I have two supply wagons, and for some reason I can only find one when I'm playing, which is stupid because on the bar uh, that's at the bottom of the screen... On the right side, I can see two supply wagons. So all I have to do is click on it and move it. And one of the supply wagons should be to the right with the... Uh, I've, in the southern part of the map, I have six-pound rifle guns, and in the northern part, all the other guns. One should be up supplying the all of those batteries that are in the north, and then one should be supplying the force in the south. The force in the south is doing a good job of just... Because the enemy moved a lot of artillery units to the southern part of the map, and that force in the south is just doing a good job of pestering uh, all those artillery units and just being a nuisance on the enemy flank. Yeah, and there's also a victory location there, so that's good. But I did not put my supply wagons in the right place, and that's a mistake I have not made in hundreds of hours of playing. So it's, it's very embarrassing, actually, to make such a, such a beginner mistake. And a couple of my units take some serious, uh, some serious damage. And, the, and the, I watch them get to very small numbers, which is going to be expensive to recover. But what I've decided is some of my two stars that get knocked down to about five or six hundred in size, I, I'm just going to take them back to one stars, and uh, I'm not going to spend a ton of money to fix them. So this is very exciting. The enemy is uh, advancing that infantry forward, has actually taken the ridge line technically, and I think he's going to like charge forward into my formation. I've uh, kind of an infantry unit in a, in a farm, kind of trying to bait him into attacking, but it, it, it he doesn't. He, he just stands at range and fires into that farmhouse. So I don't know if you can see, but uh, the J.F. Browns really did a good job of 
picking apart his artillery as his artillery moved onto the field and picking apart his infantry at range. That was really great. I know it's really hard to see, but the 20-pound parrots are doing a great job of picking apart his artillery. And will continue to do a good job. And the the 6-pound rifle is just doing a surprising job of picking apart his artillery. There's one hard-to-see unit down here on the in the southern edge of the map. And I keep trying to maneuver a, a detached skirmisher just to get eyes on that target so my six-pound rifles can tear him apart, which they do when they can see him. You see, the six-pound rifles, they... They do a really good job at close range too. I mean, they they can they can they're very accurate and and they are very fast and they they uh, they also if you move them from point to point they they move faster than uh, the heavier guns. They're they're just really really good weapons. They're good at short range, long range. You know, they're not twenty four pound howitzers, but they don't cost you the ammo that the twenty four pound howitzers cost either. The twenty four pound howitzers just hemorrhage cash in the form of ammo. And my 24-pound howitzers are now way too far away from the front line. Uh, they're not being cost-effective, where the six rifles being very cost-effective. The ammo warning sign came up for the artillery in the south. I got an ammo wagon moving to the south. But for some reason, I still haven't found the ammo wagon that is right in the middle of my line. It's, it's right underneath my commander is the problem, and I just can't find it. I'm just making sure all my guns are firing in the right place and hitting the right targets. My commander is up giving a plus 10 cover bonus to my units. That's great. And I really do just keep thinking that he's going to charge. Charge forward. One big rush. It is only about um, roughly 250 guys in that one unit, and I'm thinking the JF Browns might be able to take him out, but I'm always looking to see if the JF Brown gets spotted. So if he does, then I'll back him up and get him hidden. Also, he's just running out of ammo. There's a beginner mistake. I took my ammo wagon that was perfectly located in the south because I can't find the other ammo wagon. And all I had to do was just click on the icon and it would have become uh, apparent where it is. And I'm looking at the video and I can see where it is. That's just a beginner mistake. Keep the wagons moving and keep them spread out. Yeah, I want the detached skirmisher to roll up and take a shot on his artillery. And he very wisely has an infantry unit right there. And then, after this, it becomes really difficult to get the right line of sight because of the contours of the terrain. He goes invisible, his unit goes invisible, and then somehow I have trouble finding him again. And uh, that's too bad. So I moved forward. He's not visible. I don't know if he fell back. 
or I'm just at the wrong angle. Now I'm too close to the infantry unit. I'm going to get hit by the infantry unit again. Yeah, it's just it just all went badly. And now the guy's down to under 100, so I need to go back and merge him back into the parent unit. Then try again. So I decide that uh, I'm going to attack and take the fight to the enemy, but I had wanted the enemy to attack me. I thought that, you know, on Major General, the, the AI would be a lot more aggressive. I guess we had close to even numbers when this started, and now he's outnumbered probably 2 to 1. I'm just looking at the red bar. My artillery really is just chipping away. I think at this point, if I hit him really hard, he has a lot of very small uh, units, and a lot of them are just going to break up. And if I move my artillery forward and get even better shots on, on his artillery, some of his artillery units are going to be dead even before I get to him. I get those 24-pound howitzers within canister range, and his whatever kind of a line, front line he has, is going to you know, be ripped apart. And most of my army hasn't even fired a shot yet. I'm thinking, okay, we've chipped away at this guy long enough, and it's worked out really well. Now it's time to hit him. So everybody's moving up to do that. Trying to not lose any more men from my really expensive units. Trying to keep my cost down uh, that I'm going to have to replace in camp. And it, it turns out that that's actually a pretty good idea because it, it costs me almost nothing to go into the next battle because I do that. And anyway, I have three or four more units that if the attack goes really well, they can swing around and hit the enemy uh, on the left flank because all I see on his far left flank of this position is a tiny unit of 200 and some men and then another unit of 300 men. I might be able to turn his entire flank and that would be that would be excellent. So my artillery is now closer so we're gonna see what that that does to him. Yeah, keep bounding the 24-pound howitzers forward so they get closer and closer to the enemy. I would like to get the 24-pound howitzers very close to his line. So I have some units now that are very, very low in size. So, like I said, though, that turns out to be not much of a problem. Because some of the two-star units are just going to become one-star units. I'm not going to spend a lot of money to keep them at two stars. They're just too small. Finally, he attacks. But there's only 13 minutes left.
You're actually charged with uh, that three-star unit and his unit, and I have supporting fire from several units, and he just drops to zero and then shatters. That was really neat. That three-star unit just tore him up. Uh, really enjoyed that. So he came in and inflicted some damage on my unit, but not much, and then my unit just shattered him with, with supporting fire. Um, but, but that was really neat. Ooh, the three-star unit just took a volley. That was not cool. There's not much left of his army, and I can see that he has finally advanced everybody into the battle. So that unit is way too small. 500 and some men, that's way too small. I want to get him out of there. Then I advance all of my units that have been kind of sitting on the flank. And now my very good units are around the flank of his position. And I intend to just roll him up. I should have moved up my six pound rifle units. And I, I see an opportunity to just end the battle here and wipe him out. But then the timer goes off. But overall, it was neat to see uh, Pickett's charge again. It's been a long time since I've got to do a real Pickett's charge. And, and that was very cool. And now we'll go to the fourth day and wipe out the Confederate Army.